Hi everyone, welcome to the new episode of the show. It's Erika Paul here, and I'm really excited to welcome our guest, Chrissy Wellington. Chrissy is the world's number one female Ironman triathlete, a four-time Ironman world champion, world record holder, and a world MBE and OBE. Just a quick reminder before we go to Chrissy, this podcast is brought by 33 Fuel Natural Sport Nutrition, and it couldn't be a better sponsor when we speak about champions. 33 Fuel has been awarded by Runner's World magazine as Best Health Product of the Year. If you are searching a powerful, natural and tasty way to fuel your sports session, don't look further. Go to 33fuel.com. But let's not delay the exciting episode with Chrissy Wellington. Welcome, Chrissy. Um, you are number one female Ironman triathlete, four times world champion, world record holder, award an MBE and OBE, being voted from Sunday Times a Sport Woman of the Year inducted into Ironman Hall of Fame. Uh, you're an author of books. So in brief, you are a truly remarkable woman. So Chrissy, achieving so much, what does it all mean to you? Um, I reflect back on my life and I just, I realize what a phenomenal journey it's been. And in many ways, I could never have predicted the path that my life would have taken. And that's what's been so surprising and um, so impactful is that your life course just doesn't develop as, as you might expect. And then every step of the way, I'm presented with opportunities and, you know, I'm able to to seize those opportunities and it takes me in a direction that I could never have imagined. But, you know, Eric, you use the term role model and I'm really flattered that you would. Um, and I think we often look at sports people, people of all, you know, walks of life and, and see them as role models. Um, and I think sometimes we put people on a pedestal and by the term role model, we think they're infallible and invincible. And I'd like to be considered a role model, but for people to realize that I'm not perfect <laughs> and I'm vulnerable and I make mistakes and I've overcome adversity and that the pursuit of success or excellence hasn't come at a cost and hasn't always been easy. So I, 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 I really appreciate that people consider me a role model, but I ho hope that they also realize that they too can achieve success in whatever sphere they want to. And that also I'm, everyone can do incredible things and I don't feel that I'm special <laughs> in that in that regard we all have talents and mine just happened to take me onto the world stage and for that I am so incredibly grateful but I I don't think necessarily that you know I should be held up as this kind of invincible <laughs> role model that's not without their faults or flaws. Being competitive is is obviously in your DNA. There are no doubts. If I'm not wrong, in the early days you were self-trained. As an athlete, was it hard for you to start to work with a coach? And how important is the figure of a coach to achieve a success? I, I've always been really fiercely independent, Erica, and... Mm. I found it incredibly difficult to ask for help in, in many spheres of my life. I wanted to kind of be, be resourceful and, and be independent and 
take responsibility. But I, I realize, especially through sport, that in order to be able to achieve my potential, I had to accept that there were areas of my performance that I was not an expert in. <laughs> and that while I, whilst I was good <laughs> at executing mm -hmm. at swim, bike and run, I didn't have the knowledge and understanding and information in all of the other aspects of, of, of being a professional sports person. So whether that's setting a training program, whether that's sports psychology, nutrition, um, strength and conditioning, physiotherapy, all of those things, I had to lean on those that were experts in, the, in, in their field. And, and likewise, I had to lean on those within my, you know, my support team so that my family my my friends my sponsors even even the media and that I had to I had to work with others in order to achieve this shared goal and my coach was such or my coaches were such an important part of my my team both prior to becoming a professional athlete I had a, a fantastic running coach the late Frank Horwell who um, had a, a squad based in based in London, um, and it was through him that I first learned about varied intensity training, and actually had a running program that would, uh, you know, carve out my progress towards what I hoped would be a, a three hour. Um, sub three hour marathon and then I had a coach that um guided me to my first world championship victory which was as a, an amateur in 2006 and then as a professional athlete um I had two principal coaches um uh, over the course of my my career and and their victories uh, sorry my victories are also theirs you know I could not have achieved what I did without them not only that they set a uh, set me a program that was suitable and adapted to me and, and proved to be very, very successful, but all of the other support that a coach provides as a as a mentor and as a counsel, um, uh, as a shoulder to cry on, um, as a motivational force. Um, and then Dave Scott, my last coach, is, uh, is an incredible friend and he remains a friend to this day. And, and I feel really, really blessed to have taken that journey um, with him. So for me, it, it, it took a while to cede responsibility to, for my training to someone else and to trust, to entrust my my success <laughs> um of to place my success in the, in the hands of someone else but i i realize now that 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 was absolutely necessary um and through that through that collaboration i think you can enjoy the process so much more i mean we talk about success we talk about outcomes we talk about victories and, and winning world championships but for me, really, it was all also about the the journey and the process and to share that journey with my coaches was so important. I think it's really important for sports people of all abilities that seek the help of a coach to recognize also that you're not necessarily with a coach for life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we evolve and we change as athletes. And sometimes the best thing that an athlete can do is it is to to recognize when that coach athlete relationship is not working and, and be mature enough to reflect on why that might be and, and then maybe transition to 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 another coach. And and I had to do that. And and as I evolved as an athlete, I moved from one coach to another because I realized that I needed something different as I progressed through my career. I, I, you know, my first coach was very authoritarian um, and it was not very collaborative. And I 
as I progressed, I realized that I wanted a much more reciprocal relationship and, and one that, you know, was based on, on friendship mm-hmm. as well. And so I think as we evolve as athletes, we, we might stay with the same coach for the duration of our career. Some athletes do, but, but many don't. And it's recognizing, you know, when a relationship is productive and healthy and, and when it might not be and being prepared to um to to make that make that transition as well in 2011 you won your last Sakona Ironman World Championship and you have described it as the perfect race what made it so perfect so the perfect race is not a race where everything goes perfectly so Mm -hmm. if we look at an Ironman race is a microcosm of life. Not everything in life goes perfectly. You have highs, you have lows, and you need to embrace and endure both. And a race is no different. So I never went into an Ironman thinking, this is going to go perfectly. I almost expected and and embraced the the undulations, the highs and the lows. I knew that I was going to feel discomfort. I knew that I was going to feel pain. I knew that there were going to be situations that I would have to encounter, you know, flat tires or cramps or, you know, times when my body felt like it was failing me. Um, So the perfect race is one, not where things go perfectly, but where you overcome all the imperfections perfectly. And and I felt that I did that in 2011. I had a crash two weeks before and I went into the race physically very, very compromised, but also kind of riddled with self-doubt. And I went through, you know, some, some processes to, um, uh, to adapt mentally to the to the situation and the that race in my mind completed me yeah. because it was the race where I finally felt that I was worthy of being a champion it was the race where I felt physically and mentally annihilated at the end and it was the race where I had to battle with my competitors that I'd always craved. I think that the beauty of that race was in the challenge. The beauty was in the difficulty and the beauty was in that I achieved more than I ever thought I could. And it completed me and and that was all you can ask for or, or all I could ask for as a professional athlete, the race where I finished and I thought that is the best version of my racing self and that is why Erica that at that point I knew that the time was right to retire from professional sport because I don't think I could have ever had experienced that again I think I just felt liberated in that I'd answered maybe the question that I'd always wanted to know is when the chips are down, how good can you be? And how, dig can, how deep can you dig? And I answered that question and I felt completed. And that's why it was, it was my perfect race. It wasn't the perfect race in terms of my running form, in terms of time, in terms of my splits for each of the three disciplines. But it was perfect, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So how was it, this transition uh, to go from uh, an Ironman champion uh, to refocus and find uh, again yourself? I think it will resonate with everyone when I say that change is hard and we've experienced it this year. We've all had to adapt and change and transition from one way of life to another. And transitioning out of a relationship transitioning from a career making a change and moving to a new country that they're all difficult challenging processes and transitioning away from professional sport you know is isn't easy um I was able to take control of that decision and for that I'm I'm really happy and really grateful I, I, 
decided to leave the sport on my own terms rather than it being decided for me through kind of non-selection for a team or injury or mm-hmm. something like that. So I felt that I was empowered to make that decision. And we are blessed to be professional athletes. It, it's an absolute honor and a privilege. Um, and I I found the process of moving away from the sport incredibly hard. You lose your sense of structure, your goal, your routine, your sense of identity, the validation that comes intrinsically from your training and racing and extrinsically the validation in terms of who you are and what you've achieved and what constitutes success. Um, So all of that is called into question. Um, However, the, the easiest thing for me to do would have been to continue as a professional athlete. It's not easy physically or mentally, but it was my comfort zone. You know, I was at the top of my game. I was four-time world champion. I was world record holder. That, that, you know, that was my, you know, my comfort zone of, of, of success, for example. But you don't progress and grow and develop if you stay doing what you've always done or you just stick with what you're good at. So the most challenging thing for me to do was to leave the sport and to carve out a life after sport because every professional athlete needs to leave the sport that they do at some point. Um, so the, the the question is not if, but, but when. And mm-hmm. I... I wanted to embrace that challenge and to find out who I was outside of being Chrissy Wellington, four-time world champion. I wanted to embrace different aspects of my personality, different aspects of life, set new goals, um, find a new, you know, a new routine. And I, I, I slowly journeyed along that path I had to be kind to myself I had to be patient I had to go through that horrible scary place where you don't know who you are and what you're passionate about and what you want to be and what next day what the next day is going to look like but you get through it and you lean on others and you explore yourself and you um you're curious because how can anyone find out what they're passionate about if they're not curious? You just need an appetite for exploration. So you're curious, you explore, you network, you read, you and you start to work out who you are. And I've come a long way along that along that journey to the point where I... I don't feel that my identity is solely wedded to myself as a former professional athlete. And I feel um, loved, valued and respected based on successes or, or, or factors, I should say, that aren't necessarily my sporting performance. Uh, I, yeah, well, yeah. What, what is success? We don't know what, I mean, is success, you know winning a race or is it you know having a really strong relationship with part with a partner or 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 seeing our daughter laugh with with happiness is it achieving something in in my career is it having balance is it getting eight hours sleep is it you know I I'm 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 slowly working out what success is for me because previously it was winning a race and and so people look at me and think well she she won this she's very successful but I'm trying to see success through a slightly different lens rather than always see it through kind of satisfying my competitive streak and through a position at a race and things like things like that because success and happiness I guess aren't one and the same Mm -hmm. and I I think what's really important for me in my life right now is as is that kind of pursuit of happiness mm-hmm. rather than that pursuit of 
success, if that makes sense. I just think that I'm not placing as much emphasis, like like my happiness, my my the essence of who I am, I guess, isn't wedded to that performance metric as much as it used to be. If you could go back uh, to your Ironman winning ways, is there anything you would do differently from a nutrition perspective, either during training or racing? I don't live with with regret. I think you make decisions in your life based on the best information that you have at the time. My nutritional strategy throughout my career was iterative in that it it wasn't a static strategy and it, it it evolved. It was very much focused on performance at that time. So I, if I reflect back, it was very much on how can, what, what can I take to maximize my performance in training and in this, and in this race, rather than necessarily thinking about what are the long-term implications of consumption of, you know, various, various products and I think we know having having worked with you guys having read a lot more I'm becoming increasingly aware of those short-term impacts but also the longer-term impacts of some of the products that I I relied on in in racing um so do I regret the strategy I adopted uh, no I don't because I don't live with regret and I was an incredibly successful athlete based on that. But I don't necessarily think that I was taking a long-term perspective when I um, when I consumed the products that I did. Um, so now looking forward, what I tend, what I want to do is fuel for performance, but also fuel for holistic health, mm. if that makes sense, because Absolutely. the two are so in, inextricably inextricably linked um and it's also worth saying that whilst i consumed during races some uh you know high high or uh, kind of carbohydrate rich products Mm -hmm. um in kind of fluid and semi-fluid form I, I only really did this in racing. My my daily diet um, was um, largely made up of kind of whole foods, natural products, lots of fresh fruit, lots of vegetables, lots of nuts, lots of seeds, meat, um, uh, uh, kind of grains, um, pulses, things like that. So it wasn't a an athletic diet based on the consumption of sports products. Yeah. Um, I used those very strategically, um, and mainly when I when I raced and developed, like I said, developed a strategy that worked for me. But going forward, would I adopt the same strategy again? Um, I'd probably nuance it and and change things up slightly um because i'm just becoming increasingly aware of um how these products are made um and yeah the long the shorter and the long longer term implications yeah definitely i have to say that also when you were racing there were not so much uh, uh, there were not so much the awareness because no one was speaking about it and also there were not so much uh, so many product uh, available there were not product available they were natural so uh, or you take that once or you take that once absolutely um i think it was it was just taken as it was a matter of course that this is what this is what you would you would have on on race day um and like yes unless you go back 30 years with you know Dave Scott and Mark Allen who are multiple multiple world Ironman champions and they were eating you know kind of figs or sandwiches or kinds of different products so you know 
nutrition is is a fascinating area it's in such a constant state of flux and i you know the evidence is is growing and people can be more empowered more informed and like you said there are a wider range of products now for people to um to choose from and and that's fantastic but it also it also complicates things because the messaging around nutrition around diet is so confused it's Absolutely. you know quite binary in terms of good and bad and um or you know high fat low carb low carb high fat and, and people can it becomes quite polarized and divisive isn't it Absolutely. um so you can forgive people for getting with with the increased information the increased products available people are that there are more opportunities to to consume a wider array of uh, of products but people are also becoming confused um, i think the most important thing is is people adopt an n equals one philosophy and that you you know you're your best guinea pig mm. so <laughs> try all different products yeah. and work out and record how how they make you feel and not just in terms of am I hitting my split times, but how does it impact my sleep and 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 my mood and my hormones and, and my blood work if if you get that if you get that done on a on a regular basis. So, you know, people can record how you know what their their reaction to various products and and then develop a strategy that that works for them both in terms of performance and and in health and and I think that's the best the best way forward um because it's not a one size fits all and it's not a binary kind of this is good and this is this is bad I think people have to work out what's what's best for them and that might be an iterative process and you might have to be prepared to to change and adapt and um and nuance things especially as you know as you get older and as your career progresses through sport visualization is a performance technique used by lots of athletes before racing what is the power of visualization for you visualization is um is incredibly powerful because i think positivity is incredibly powerful um so where you know, as, as the evidence around nutrition, you know, expands and grows and deepens, so too does evidence around that mind-body connection. So our physical being connected to our psychological self. Um, so especially in a sport like triathlon, you know, a large part of the challenge is is psychological and having the tools and weapons and strategies to be able to to endure because that's what we're doing it's an endurance sport we need to be able to endure so we develop those tools and strategies to enable our mind to to endure and to be able to um sometimes uh override some of the sensations that our physical body is telling us so visualization is one strategy so visualizing um yourself as um as successful and and as executing a you know a race in a certain way actually I always also visualized things that might go wrong so that then I had a psychological a positive psychological strategy for dealing with them so you've gone through that process in your mind so that you can be confident that you know how you would deal with it in the eventuality that something does happen so visualization is incredibly important but there are loads of little you know hacks that you can you can use to remain mentally strong you know compartmentalizing a training session or a race into different segments very much staying in in the moment so not getting too carried away with yourself um i used to count repetitively i used to have posit a bank of positive mental images um uh i used to have songs that i played in my head mm -hmm. um and most importantly i used to recount times that i have overcome adversity in the past mm. 
So that is incredibly powerful because you realize that if you can overcome discomfort, pain, challenges, um, disappointment in the past, then you can do so again. Mm. And, you know, every, every, every Ironman race I ever did, I wanted to quit. <laughs> and I, and then when the next race came along and I felt that I, I recollected the time previously when I wanted to quit and I didn't, and I went on to achieve, um, my goal. And that's incredibly powerful. So that remembering that you are capable, remembering that you are, uh, that you are strong, remembering that you are able to endure and have examples um, to back that up is, is really, really important. Um, but yeah, m mental, mental strength, um, is, is such an important part of being, a um, being a professional athlete and visualization you know, is, is a key part of that. What advice would you give as someone really wanted to achieve the ultimate performance for example, looking to place inside the top five in the age group in Kona, what are the most important things to focus on? And um, not on that outcome goal. Hmm. Focus on the process. Focus on executing every step of the process the best you can. Of course, that process needs to be developed with the, you know, with the goal in mind, but you, you focus on the process and executing each and every minute and each and every day in the best way you possibly can. Um, so that's number one. Surround yourself with those that can support you on your journey and don't be afraid to lean on them. Mm -hmm. um, embrace rest and recovery as part of training rather than as something that, um, as I did, as kind of tantamount to weakness, rest and recovery is, is part of training. So resting our body um, and, and resting our mind. And that also includes things like, um, you know, nutrition and sleep and rest days, um, massage, all of, the, all of those things. So those recovery processes are really important part of, of maximizing performance. Um, don't adopt a performance at all costs mentality. So our holistic health is really, really important. So don't sacrifice everything at the altar of, of, of performance and, and neglect every other aspect of your health, whether that be your relationships, whether that be your hormonal health, your career, um, all of those other aspects of, of, of life. Um, most most importantly enjoy it enjoy enjoy the journey um because i don't necessarily think that the outcome is what's going to make you happy it's the process of getting there so it's really important that the journey is a, a gratifying enjoyable satisfying one and that you're doing it for you not because of what you think other people expect of you or because um, of you know what you might think you should achieve but because you're actually doing it for you Chrissy you are an incredible endurance athlete you know something about resilience for sure um, thinking about this crazy period of the lockdown uh, lockdown has been a time where we all need to be more resilient what is your golden advice on how to achieve mental resilience, emotional resilience, and physical resilience? I, I think by staying in the moment mm. is, is really, really important. Um, often we look too far down the line um, and staying in the moment is, is really, really important. Just maximizing yourself and, and your life in, in the moment that, that you're in is incredibly important. 
I feel personally that I'm much more resilient with the support of, of others. Mm. Um, I'm not an island, and I, and I feel especially th- emotional resilience. Um, I, that that comes for me from from seeking the support and 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 having the love of of those those around me um physical resi- resilience by taking a holistic approach mm. nice so you know our, even in this context our, our resilience to to viral transmission is is through being physically active having strong relationships getting enough sleep thereby protecting our our immune system the you know the 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 best nutrition diet we can we can have all of those things create physical physical resilience so i think it's taking a holistic a holistic approach and and trying to make sure that you're you're looking at all of the pillars of 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 health that you um that you possibly can a mental resi- mental resilience I, I hopefully i went through some of the strategies that mm-hmm. um that i use to be as 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 strong um as as strong as possible from being an iconic ironman champion you made the switch to ultra running what attracted you to the world of ultras short answer the challenge <laughs> I I guess that <laughs> you know I I needed I needed something that that um I needed something f- to focus on that was a, a a sporting goal something different something that I I that was new something I didn't know whether I'd I you know be able to to be successful at something where I could develop new skills especially going you know running off road So really it, it was it was a new it was a new and exciting challenge for me um and I've yeah I've thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed all the races that I've done they they've been much more like journeys than yeah. than races and I've I've really enjoyed the experience and the kind of non-metric based aspects of performance you're not necessarily concerned about split times or pace you're just you're out there journeying and that that really appealed to me you step away from the podium and you redefine yourself and now you're involved with park run and they find a brilliant free running event how did you get involved with them met the founder of Park Run and he invited me to come on board to set up Junior Park Run which is a a series of free weekly 2k events for 4 to 14 year olds and their families every Sunday and so I came on board in 2013 to set that up and now my role has evolved I'm now global head of health and well-being so I develop interventions to engage those that are less active in in our 2000 plus events in the 22 countries around the world in which we operate um covid times aside so I, i mean i thoroughly enjoy my job it's it's gratifying i feel really lucky to work with a fantastic team and for a phenomenal organization that are seeking to maximize people's health through the prism of physical activity and and volunteering and it's something that's very close to my heart it's something that I feel very passionate about so yeah i'm i'm really blessed to have made that made that my career so crisy thanks so much for all your time It's been such a a beautiful conversation with you i really really uh, enjoy it Um if uh, people they want to to, kind of, to find you to connect with you on social where they can find you Yeah I've I think for my own mental health I've stepped away a little from social media um I I find it quite toxic sometimes mm. um I'm ne- I've never been on in- Instagram um but I am on Twitter I'm so I'm quite active on on Twitter and so they can find me on Chrissy Smiles 
uh, on on Twitter. So that's probably the best way. I do have a website, but I haven't updated it. But yeah, I'm usually quite responsive on 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 Twitter. Thanks so much to be such a beautiful guest. Enjoy the continuation of your day. Thank you so much, and thanks thanks for the opportunity to chat. This podcast is brought by 33 Fuel Natural Sport Nutrition. If you are searching a powerful, natural and tasty way to fuel your sports session, don't look further. Go to 33fuel.com.